morning and welcome to St. Paul's Lutheran Church here in Burlington, North Carolina on the first Sunday of Advent. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. By your merciful protection, awaken us to the threatening dangers of our sins and keep us blameless until the coming of your new day. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Isaiah. O oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood, and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The appointed psalm is from Psalm 80. Hear, O shepherd of Israel, leading Joseph like a flock. Shine forth, you that are enthroned upon the cherubim, in the presence of Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Stir up your strength and come to help us. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angered despite the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have given them bowls of tears to drink. You have made us the derision of our neighbors, and our enemies laugh us to scorn. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, the son of man you have made so strong for yourself. And so will we never turn away from you. Give us life that we may call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you are called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, In those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, 
with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds and from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and put forth its sheaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angel in heaven nor the son, but only the father. Be aware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or at cock crow or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Perhaps you noticed in the verses of today's appointed psalm that there was a particular verse that was repeated several times. It's a typical device in some psalms in which the psalm is broken up by an antiphon that is repeated throughout in order to sort of drive home a theme or a point of the psalm. In today's psalm, number 80, the repeated antiphon is this. Restore us, O God of hosts, show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. No doubt that sounds familiar to us. I mean, it is the idea that God can cause his face to shine upon his people. That's what the countenance is. We hear those words in the benediction that is often the blessing at the end of each worship service. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Now those lines were just as familiar to Israel as they are familiar to us, as this is the priestly benediction given to Aaron by God with which he and the priest were to bless the people. And the original line of that, the original last line of that blessing, the Lord look upon you with favor, was actually closer to the Hebrew. It said, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. It is to say that the Lord's face is lifted up in a smile of favor rather than scowling in anger or disapproval. So what we find then in this blessing, in this benediction, are the synonymous ideas about being in God's favor. That the Lord's face should shine upon us is that he would show us his gracious favor by not only smiling upon us, but also bathing us in his endless and glorious light. So the psalmist is remembering this priestly blessing then as a part of his people's salvation history. And he appeals to the Lord God in prayer on behalf of his people using some of those same words that appeal to their salvation. Restore us, O God of hosts, show the light of your countenance and we shall be saved. The psalm in its entirety likely comes from the period of Israel's exile. The psalmist prays for the shining face of God to be revealed, knowing that they are for the moment stuck in the darkness of exile, removed from the land of their inheritance, and he acknowledges their predicament and he laments of it. 
Interesting enough, though, the psalmist acknowledges that it is the Lord who is the one who has judged them and put them into this exile. And he asks of the Lord, how long, O Lord, will you be angry with your people? And yet, at the same time, he also has faith in the Lord to be their saving help the one who can turn them from sin, restore their fortunes and give them life and cause his light to shine upon them once again. Restore us, O God of hosts, show the light of your countenance and we shall be saved. I was thinking about this prayer of the psalmist in connection with our season of Advent since light plays such a role in this season. And it's not a far cry for us to connect the light of God's face shining upon us to the light of Christ who is coming into the world and who's coming into the world we anticipate and celebrate. We celebrate it with light, with candles on a wreath to mark the weeks leading up to Christmas and the light of the Christmon tree adorned with the symbols of Christ that will soon appear here in the sanctuary. The Advent season is a season of anticipation and hope for the coming of Christ, not only as the babe of Bethlehem at Christmas of whom we sing radiant beams from thy holy face, but also his coming again in glory at the conclusion and fulfillment of all things revealed in that same splendor of light beheld by the disciples at his transfiguration. But Advent is also a season like Lent, a season of repentance and self-examination, recognizing in advance of the coming Christ that though saved by his death and resurrection, we still live in a land that struggles with darkness. We still live in a world in which our adversary, the devil, rages, refusing to admit that he has lost. Just as the days of fall turn to winter and get darker and darker, it presents us with a metaphor that the world is being plunged even further and ever further into vast darkness. What with the evil that humans do to one another, the violence, the wars, along with all our hardships, our trials, and our pain. Indeed, that is the work of our adversary, the devil, who would have us believe that there is no light that there is no divine face to shine on us with favor. Maybe we can be tricked into thinking that even though Christ has conquered, somehow the darkness still has power over us. Realizing our continued daily struggle with sin, death, and the devil, we join the psalmist in his prayer Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance and we shall be saved. But we pray that prayer in faith and in confidence that the darkness, in fact, has not won the day. We confess that God has caused his face to shine upon us through Christ, the babe of Bethlehem, through his teaching, his signs and wonders, his proclamation of the kingdom, through his death, his resurrection, and his ascension, and through his promise to come again. At that time, not only will we be restored by God, but we and all of creation will be made completely new, bathed in the light of the glory of God. Until then, we see the present darkness as a sign of the light that is to come. And if it often seems that our tribulations and sufferings are multiplied upon us, then that too is only a sign that our Lord draws more and more near. Why else should that wicked serpent, the devil, inspire such rage and hatred and violence among us except in the fear that our Lord is near? 
After all, the old saying goes, the darkest hour is just before dawn. And perhaps that's the same in our life of faith. Jesus himself says in Mark's gospel this morning, in those days and after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. An 8th century English monk uh, known as the Venerable Bede wrote concerning this text saying that the stars at the day of judgment will seem to be dark, not by any failure of their own luster, but in consequence of the increase of of the true light that is throwing them into shade. In other words, those great created lights in the heavens, the sun, the moon, and the stars, will all seem to fail in that day compared with the glorious and uncreated light of Christ as he comes with the clouds. Indeed, though the darkness may deepen and all other lights may seem to be extinguished, we continue in the true light that is Christ our Lord. We light our candles in hope of his coming. We illuminate our trees to celebrate the uncreated light that he is that is coming into the world. And we pray, restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance and we shall be saved. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.